Welcome to the uh, OxPad seminar for May 15th. Uh, this is uh, preparing for an OxPad patrol, and this is really also kind of preparing for uh, an OxPad academy because for many people, it's the first time you've gone on an OxPad patrol, and there's a lot of things to think about. So uh, we're going to really cover the waterfront tonight. Uh, and uh, I think we got a fairly small group, so we can probably have some uh, discussion. I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole on uh, Ox data, uh, but try to try to get the idea of what are the major things you need to think about in terms of uh, in terms of preparing for a patrol. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. Hey, Joey. Hello. So uh, two things. I've already congratulated you and your five compatriots on uh, your uh, becoming OxPad uh, or ACA instructors. Really, really thrilled about that. I think it's just fantastic. Uh, and so thank you for making that happen. Uh, and I was hoping you might manage the uh, the chat. Now. Okay. So, uh, you, okay. So we are going to... Uh, Look at this agenda. Uh, we're going to look at Ox Data 2. We're going to look at uh, the process of offering a kayak for use as an OPFAC. We're going to look at uh, requesting patrol orders, uh, closing patrol orders, a lot of the things you need to think about in 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 that process. Hello. Yeah. We're, we're going to look at uh, PPE and uniforms. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, OTO John Murphy is on, on the line. He's hoping to join us tonight. Uh, he's coming back from uh, uh, a ceremony that, uh, that he attended today, but uh, hopefully he'll have some things to say as well. And then I think there'll be plenty of time for discussion. So I want to start off just saying that I think Ox Data 2 is, is really central to a lot of what we're doing on a patrol and it's really worth putting the time in to, to master it. Uh, and it's reasonably workable, I think, once you get the hang of it, uh, but it, it does take some commitment to get through it. So uh, it's the IT information technology group. Uh, and I just, uh, I think what I did is I, I Googled or I searched on uh, Ox data training, and they've got a, a great page that that has different guides on uh, uh, patrol orders, on facility management, and activity management. And so I'm not going to go through all those decks tonight, but I think it's really there are good resources there, and it's it's worth using them. Are you going to send out this deck so that we have those hot links to click on? Yeah, I can do that. Great. Uh, probably what I'll do when I announce the uh, the recording, I'll, I'll put a uh, I'll get this posted on our website, and uh, you could be able to download it from the website. So this is uh, this is the IT information technology website, and you see Ox Data Two, a lot of good resources here. Uh, you know, I think a lot of times people just kind of don't know where to look for stuff, but, but there are some some very good uh, resources there. So this is when you when you log into Ox Data, this is the first thing you see. Uh, this is the main screen, and some of the uh, drop downs that I think are really valuable. The member uh, heading here is is how I get to all my own information. And when I'm working to get people certified, I can see what their uh, tasks are that they've completed towards becoming an OxPad operator. I can see what uh, what their qualifications are. A lot of good information there under the member tab. You got your activity logs here, uh, facilities and facility inspections. Sometimes these flip around depending on what screen you're on, you might have to do the drop down for more. But uh, this is the first screen that you come to. 
So the first uh, thing we want to look at tonight is offering a kayak for use as an OPFAC. So the, basically the flow of that is the owner offers the facility, the owner requests a facility inspection that triggers an email to the vessel inspector who uh, comes over and performs the inspection and then uh, approves, doesn't approve it, but recommends approval to Dirox and then Dirox uh, approves it in the Ox uh, data system. So from that uh, screen that we were on a couple of minutes ago, it showed uh, kind of the, the first Ox data screen. Here we've, uh, we've clicked on uh, facilities and we're going to create a new facility record. So I don't know why they do this, but it seems like the most important buttons are the hardest ones to read. Um, mm. So the new the new button here is is what you click on when you're going to create a new facility. And these, by the way, are a bunch of these are mostly my op facts that are already in the system. So what happens is when you've been looking at op facts, uh, the most recently viewed will will come up at the top. So here we've, uh, I've already created a facility record called example one. So, you know, after we clicked on new facility, we uh, we got this menu, this uh, um, screen that we have to fill out. And some of the key things to fill out are you wanna make sure that it's a kayak uh, record type, that it's not a regular boat. Uh, when you when you first start out, uh, these the status has changed when, when, when we're when we're ready to submit it for uh, for an inspection. This this uh, the status will change. Uh, the uh, you indicate the start date and the end date that you're offering it for. You request an inspection date. And there's a lot of details down here about, uh, you know, fiberglass, that it's a sea kayak and those kinds of things. And you fill all that out. Hey, Roland, are you, um, would you like for me to bring questions from the chat room up right away or would you like to hold uh, on? Yeah, I think we can do some of that. Um, Scott is asking about uh, who might be a vessel inspector for Oxpad kayaks. So, there is no special uh, certification for kayak inspectors. So any vessel inspector can do it. Uh, you probably, if you know, if you have somebody in your flotilla who's uh, understands paddlecraft, that's a much better way to go. Um, and I think that's part of our challenge is to make sure that the vessel inspectors are well educated on on paddlecraft. But a lot of them aren't, and a lot are not comfortable with uh, with paddlecraft. Um, so it's Roland, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Um, so I took a, a little class the other night about the PSF endorsement. And if any of the instructors here have that endorsement, it would be really good for them to teach that to their flotilla to give, you know, just an average flotilla member, a much better understanding of kayaking and how to do vessel exams yep. and any other questions that um you know the public might have yeah and uh you know we've really got a great recording of uh that mark and uh and mike did you know showing uh, a lot of good information on how to perform a, a vessel exam on paddlecraft so i think we do have some good content there um so let's see, let's go back up here. So here when the, uh, when the couple of things to note, it's at least in, here in our district, in district five south, they are requiring that we 
not only upload the form 7009, but also a photo of the port side of the uh, kayak. Uh, so that, I think it's not gonna go through if that's not uploaded. Uh, but basically, you know, just sort of big 30,000 foot, what, the way you wanna think about this is the owner is creating the facility record is uploading this information, the the completed 7009 that's got all the information on the kayak and uh, who the owner is and permissions to use it, as well as a photo that gets uploaded here. And after everything's carefully checked over, then you, uh, I think there's like a submit here, you know, the changes that the status. And then you're going to request a facility inspection. And another thing to, to think about is it's much easier to find all this stuff in Oxdata if you write down these numbers. So write down the facility record number, which will probably really is all you really need, the facility record number. But uh, there's also going to be a separate facility inspection number once this gets submitted. So when you read... The owner requests that inspection. It goes to the, uh, triggers an email to the uh, vessel examiner. And the vessel examiner comes out and basically takes that same form 7009 and checks everything to make sure it's all there and that it's all looking good. And then that gets you notice we're on a facility inspection record now instead of the facility record. And there's a place to upload that completed uh, and signed 7009. So both the inspector and the uh, owner are gonna sign that. And then it gets submitted for approval. And then it goes to Dirox. And if everything goes well, you'll have it back in a day or two uh, as, a, as a new facility. Uh, a lot of times things kind of go off the rails and you know we're not sure why they go off the rails, but it's a lot of times because we didn't submit it. Uh, everything gets filled out, but we don't actually uh, submit it. So it's very important to check the status of those uh, um, here, submit for approval. Want to make sure that gets submitted and then go back and check the status of that record. You know, it should say something like under review. Hey, Roland, two more yeah. questions before we move on to patrol orders. Yeah. First one is from Tug, and it's uh, if you have several facilities, do you have to have one of each of the list of equipment items for each facility? No, and it's it's kind of the same thing like when we do vessel exams, we have somebody who's got several boats and they've got, uh, you know, enough life jackets for each boat, but they're not taking each boat out at the same time. Uh, you need to have enough for the actual use that you're you're using. So if you're if you're using them all at the same time, you should have you should have all that uh, equipment. Can I just ask, so like, for example, if I had two boats and I wanted to let somebody else do a patrol with my, which I do, somebody else do a patrol with my other kayak, both would have to be inspected and both would have to have enough equipment because we would be out at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Right. Of course. Um, now, now, some of that equipment might be, might be, you've probably got the paddle and, you know, yeah. the lifelines and everything on the, uh, on the kayak, but the other person might be bringing the PFD and, uh, the radio and some of the things that, uh, you know, that, uh, that are also required. Second question, Roland, uh, from Mike Marino. To submit this request, does the member have to be ACA certified or are there other certain requirements that must be met? No, anybody, in fact, you could, you could offer an opt-out for use even though you, for, for somebody else. So, you know, you might have uh, a friend who wants to support the program and they're not uh, they're not in the auxiliary. They can they can offer it for use. Are we any other questions here? 
No, sir. That is all at this point in time. Okay. So so now everything's gone perfectly and we've got our uh, op pack approved and we want to request uh, patrol orders. So the first thing, I got to mute themselves here. Uh, the first time I went to Oxpad uh, Academy was up with Ron Price close to Annapolis. And when I try to uh, to get patrol orders up there, I'm not listed for Sector Maryland. So if you know if you want to come and uh, into a different sector, it's important to to let whoever's running that uh, Oxpad Academy know, and then they can uh, send an email to Dirox to include you in the uh, in Ox data as as a person who's able to go on the water in that sector. So one of the things that uh, you know that. We don't all think about ahead. Uh, second thing to think about ahead is we all want to get paid for lunches and uh, you know mileage and things like that. You can't get paid if you don't have things set up with the finance center. So we're, I'm going to have uh, a slide on that later, but uh, this is something that needs to be done in advance before you request uh, your patrol orders. So then uh, you request the orders. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, lunches and travel expense and a little bit about uh, closing out orders. So, so um, to request a new patrol order, I think uh, on this particular screen, it's under more. So it's uh, there's a patrol order drop down, and you click new and these are some patrol orders that were already in the system that I had uh, from last year. Uh, so when you request a new patrol order, a, a patrol order number is assigned. Again, a good idea to write that down, uh, particularly if you're not really good at finding your way around aux data. Another way to find these things is you should be able to find all these things under your member record. If you go to member and then related, it's the second tab on member uh, on the member screen, you should be able to find things like your patrol orders, your facilities, your, your activities, all the things that you're, that are associated with you. But uh, good idea to write this down. Here's the facility that we're using. Um, so you basically go through and fill all this out. Um, and there's some screens where facility type is boat and some where it's paddlecraft. Uh, it's a little bit confusing, but always choose paddlecraft uh, and read carefully. Use paddlecraft whenever you have that option. So this is the, this is my my local flotilla. Uh, so when you're filling that out, you're basically just typing in your your seven digit flotilla number. And then it'll it'll come up with a drop down and you can select it off your drop down. It's going to ask you for the patrol date, whether it's morning, uh, afternoon. Uh, and that will determine what kind of uh, meals you might be eligible for. This is my order issuing authority. Here's my my sector. Your your local OIA will have patrol areas that uh, kind of make sense to them. So this is the this is the area that I'm uh, patrolling in. So you might want to talk to your operations officer for, for boat crew and see how you know how they classify these patrol areas. So this right side here is really further down the page, but I cut and pasted it further up. One of the things that I think is important to your local OIA is a description of what your mission's all about. And 
this is the kind of information that our local boat station is looking for. So Station Oregon Inlet, Paddlecraft, OPFAC, 16016. McDevitt is uh, doing training with 14 participants near Collington Island in Kitty Hawk Bay. Give the, uh, the location coordinates. We're authorized to operate uh, within a thousand yards from shore. Uh, within Kitty Hawk Bay, we'll call to confirm orders and we will check uh, PLB and PPE uh, and, and do our, our GAR scores uh, before we go on the water. So this is kind of boilerplate, but you can modify it to, you know, to your particular mission. But again, that's probably a good thing to talk to your boat crew people about and see how they are or local coxswains and see how they're entering it, what makes sense in the context of your of your station. Any questions here? Yes. Alan, you do have one question um, uh, from Donna Hornsby. Have you added Don Rice and Donna Hornsby via Durox for the Oxpad, upcoming Oxpad Academy? I have not done that. Um, so, so another, um, another thing that we've done here, and you can see it here on this description. Sometimes we don't, we don't put everybody in. Uh, well, I think it's still, it's still a good idea to put them in, even if I'm putting them in as trainees, uh, because they're not going to come up on the list later on when we try to add in the crew. So yes, uh, need to add them. So here's that uh, description that you need to, to do for your local area. Um, so this reimbursement through electronic funds transfer, prior to requesting the orders, you wanna go um, to the finance center and, and request uh, you know, this arrangement. And it's, there are a couple of different sites out there. One of the problems is a lot of there's a lot of old information floating around in uh, in the WoW websites. But this one, I believe, is is current and functioning where in a, in a way that you can actually uh, enter the data in a form and it will work. Uh, some of the others you get they're either not working or. Uh, your your firewall will get very unhappy or things like that. I will share this deck and it's got the links in it. Uh, so for uniforms, this is what we're wearing on uh, Oxpad patrols. We've got an orange shirt. Uh, we can wear the uh, the Coast Guard Auxiliary baseball hat or the uh, uh, boonie hat here. Uh, the the shirts are available through this uh, link down here. That's on our national website. Uh, these are available through uh, through the exchange. You know we we are not real picky about, especially on the water, what you're wearing for shorts. But it's, it should be the uh, navy shorts or, or dark dark shorts. Sometimes I'm wearing uh, neoprene shorts, uh, and then you know one of these hats. But these uh, for the for the ashore work, this is this is a good uniform, and you can also wear the yellow, the orange shirt for ashore. These are the five eleven pants, and these are available from a lot of uh, sources, including Amazon. So PPE. I know there's a section on PPE in the Oxpad handbook that's fairly limited. This, this is the kind of the highlights of it. Uh, and then there's a lot of gear that's associated with the OPFAC uh, that I've also got listed in the next couple of slides. But, uh, you know, I think one of the big questions is what is the Coast Guard going to supply us when we go on the water? This is something that I think we need to be asking for. Uh, we need to be asking for for the life jackets, for the uh, 
for the for the light uh, the whistle uh, and inflatables and hybrid PFDs are not uh, authorized for the uh, for the OxPad program. These are facility items that get checked when you do the offer for uh, for use. And I've highlighted some of the things that, uh, you know, that are kind of PPE related. Even though we don't necessarily call them PPE, that like the emergency cutting tool doesn't show up under the PPE section in our in our handbook. What we're trying to do with the Oxpad handbook is really spell out what the PPE is that that we need and encourage each district to supply it. And we don't know what we could get in, until we ask. So that's basically what uh, what we're doing here. Uh, the tow line is, is there's different kinds of tow lines, it's kind of depending on what kind of uh, setting you're in. Uh, and this is probably something that's not going to be supplied by uh, by Dirox. Rod, could you explain what it means when it says both ends of the tow system must be releasable? So basically, the, the kinds of tow lines that we use in coastal kayaking are on a belt. And right. when it's all stowed away, it's if you pull that quick release, the whole belt comes off. Yes. But if you were to take that tow line out and say, well, I want to have this tow line ready to go. So I'm going to put the business end of that tow line on my life jacket. That would no longer meet the requirement here because I could pull that quick release and my, my belt goes off into the water, but I've still got this uh, carabiner attached to my life jacket. Okay, I got you. So, but so a proper way to stow the carabiner on on that kind of a tow line would be to attach it uh, on the belt. And the belt itself, yeah. You know, there, there should be a special D ring on the belt to attach the carabiner. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and the personal locator beacon is something that uh, our uh, district has agreed to provide. Uh, I think there's there may be a shortage of them, and there may be some uh, some people that are having trouble getting them. But uh, this is something we think is important, and uh, you know we're hoping to see those provided, you know, in all the districts. So uh, we have uh, some other resources that I want to just go, kind of go quickly through here, and then. Uh, We'll just have a discussion. So we've been recording all these seminars and uh, they're out there uh, for your listening pleasure. Uh, we've got uh, you know Scott's navigation from uh, from last week. We've got uh, a number of good ones, including the first one, uh, the, the Oxpad handbook that Robin did back in uh, in March. So. You can get to these from our national website, the YouTube site, and, and search on OxPad seminars, and, and you'll find it. But you can also get there from our national website or from our 1607. Uh, so uh, another really good resource is the OxPad handbook. That's on the national website, or you can just search for it within, uh, within the auxiliary sites. I think it's a it's a huge improvement over what we had before. Uh, it spells out, you know, the requirements to be an OxPad operator, the requirements for an OpFac. Uh, the PPE, I think, is better described. So, uh, you know, please take a look at that. Um, here's our recreational boating safety outreach national website. This is. This is going to be getting a lot of work over the next few months, so it's not where we want it to be. But uh, if you go to the 
to the B directorate, the Recreational Boating Safety Outreach Directorate, mm -hmm. you get you get this. And if you click on Paddler, you come over here, and then you see this Oxpad tile. And there are some good resources there, including the uh, the uh, Oxpad manual, the new handbook. This is our local flotillas website, and we've got a lot of information here that uh, is very relevant for anybody involved in Oxpad. Uh, we've got a public facing section. We've got a training section that's got a lot of information on how to prepare for, for training. We have a link to the videos on the uh, from the Oxpad uh, seminars. We have our calendar of events that includes all the uh, the seminars and a link to our national site. So uh, you can you can Google 054-1607, Clotello 054-1607, and find this. Uh, it might be a good idea to do that until we get our national website uh, where we want it to be. So that's kind of a high level view. There's lots of places where we can get uh, off track, I think, in OX data and uh, you know, trying to get our OPVACs approved and things of that sort. But at a high level, that's that's basically how you get your facility approved, how you request orders, uh, how you you know get reimbursed uh, but there are resources out there to to explain those things in more detail and i'd really encourage you to look at them not a, not a question to... rollin but just a plea to remind to remind everybody about the facebook page for the division yes uh, so so scott uh, you want to you want to say a few minutes uh, a few things. So, so basically, we've got a number of Facebook uh, sites out there for each district, and Todd has been managing a national uh, Facebook page that's public facing, and also a internal, you know, sort of member facing site. And I think uh, you want to you want to explain those uh, and kind of what we're trying to accomplish there, Todd. Sure. So basically, as, as Roland mentioned, a Facebook page is generally a external public facing uh, platform. And so this is what people are going to be coming to if they're looking for a particular program or organization. Ours is facebook.com forward slash oxpad. And myself and then Anthony King with the RBS directorate, who's their social media chief, we manage that page. Uh, there's a couple of their folks that have administrative access, but I try to do a lot of sharing of not only information from other flotillas and divisions that are active with Oxpad, but also information from ACA and, and other reliable, trusted sources. What we're hoping to do is, you know, this will be the landing place when people are looking for information about Oxpad. As Roland also mentioned, we have a number of district, individual district Oxpad groups a group is usually an internal group. It's It can be found publicly through a search, but it's really designed to be more of an in-house communication okay. tool. Uh, we've been in discussion now, and, and we're going to try to set up a national OxPad group with everyone who's either doing OxPad ashore or afloat with a, with a primary emphasis on afloat, but also some ashore information as well. Uh, it was brought to our attention by a couple of of operators that it would be good to have a clearinghouse, so to speak, of ideas and networking. And, you know, there are flotillas that are doing, you know, unique programs from Casco Bay up in Maine to my own flotilla here in Southwest Missouri. And it might be a good way for folks to learn about how other people are bringing the program into their district. So look for that Oxpad group to be announced soon. I've got to get that set up. I'm, I'm getting slammed at work right now. But uh, once I get that set up, we'll get that out through the, the, the Colam. But uh, the Oxpad Facebook is up and running. Love to have people follow it, share it, have your flotilla or division uh, or district, even uh, your Facebook pages like it and share information from it. But a really good way to get that resource out. Thank you, Todd. Well, I, I must have been really effective in explaining everything. 
<laughs> Rollin, you mentioned earlier, uh, before we started the seminar, there was a discussion about PFDs. Yeah. And I'm going to post in the chat what our district, 8 Western Rivers, went with in terms of a life jacket. And I'm pretty sure this was one of the recommendations that Robin Pope had made a number of years ago. Uh, hold on to your wallets. But uh, it's a, a fairly expensive jacket. <laughs> But this is what 8 Western, uh, our OTO is issuing out to our operators at this point. I just literally got word that there's going to be a new uh, shipment of them being sent out to some of our newest operators up in Wisconsin and Minnesota uh, fairly soon. So I've got a, I have a document that, uh, that talks about PFDs. Basically, Robin uh, put down a number that he liked and and then some of us uh, shared things that we liked. They're a little bit different for coastal kayaking versus uh, river kayaking, but uh, they kind of share the uh, the expense. <laughs> I think maybe the uh, maybe the river ones is the most expensive, but uh, I can uh, I'll make sure that what you put out there gets incorporated into this document and we'll get it posted. Is there a preference on whether we use rescue PFDs with integrated tow belts or a separate tow belt? It seems to me that the integrated tow belt, most of the coastal people I know are not doing integrated tow belts, uh, but I think the river kayaking does seem to. Scott, yeah. do, you have a, do you have a take on that? Uh, just what just what you said, Rowan. Yeah, uh, but I, I think there is some personal preference, uh, uh, and it's probably you know you're probably not going to get an OTO that's going to want to like buy everything for for the district, you know. So you might have to sort of figure out what what kind of makes the most sense for uh, you know for your district. Right. And I was thinking, though, if the um, PFD has an integrated tow belt in it, that might be a way to kind of slide the tow belt in without or so that it gets paid for. I mean, I know that with Coastal, you know, I personally use a separate one, but it might be a possibility if they're on the fence on paying for things. It, it's been my experience that... Um... You, you should use what you train for and and uh, um, as a cost saving measure, I don't know that an integrated tow belt that's that's more typical in the river environment makes sense for the kind of towing we might be doing in a yeah. in a coastal environment. I think so when I think when I think towing for ox pad, we're probably not doing rescues. We're probably not pulling people out of the surf zone and things like that. We we're not supposed to be in the surf zone. Uh, it's probably somebody that you know got tired or they fell off their stand up paddle board. Um, so, uh, and I'm I'm thinking of, even on inland, you know, the we're, we're not doing white water uh, ox pad patrols. Uh, so I would think in terms of that kind of an environment. Okay. No, in RAOR, you very rarely find anybody towing anything when the river is only maybe about 30 to 40 feet wide. Yeah. I mean, most folks are towing their own boats out. Yeah. Yeah. It might be more on a lake or something like that. Yeah. Maybe I'm just in a, like, a kind of a unique area where we have Lake Erie, but then there are rivers yeah. um, and pretty wide rivers as well. So I think maybe it just depends on your environment and where you're paddling at, what would work best. Yeah, yeah. Um, Scott? I, I have um, two very unrelated questions. The, the first is, Roland, I remember that you were working on, I think what some might have termed a bootleg website for Oxpad. Um, can you share the status of that? Um, I'm not. I'm not promoting it because I'm. Uh, I'm trying to make sure that I don't compete with uh, with the legitimate uh, websites. Um, uh, under, um, but uh, the the content is on my local flotilla website. 
uh, it's not as pretty, but uh, with the contents there on the on the 16054-1607 website. Okay, great, thank you. And and my second question is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the District Seven uh, district level Oxpad instruction uh, uh, predates the new handbook, uh, and and so I my question is is do other districts have updated district level Oxpad instructions uh, post post Oxpad handbook? That's an excellent question. Uh, that's probably something that we should all be asking about. I, I'm not aware of any updates that we've done here. I, I don't. I don't think so. I'm not sure what kind of an instruction we had before, really, for, for the district, other than the national uh, commandant instruction. I'll I'll um I'll follow up on a district seven. Uh, a perspective and and keep you all up to date what I might find out about that um uh, yeah okay Roland can you can you talk really quick about um, if there has been any updates on trailering versus uh hauling kayaks on the roofs of cars so I know there's been some uh difference of opinion uh, you know across the country about whether trailering whether it's trailering when you haul the kayak on the roof of the car if you look in ox data there's not a there's not a place on the screen that says hauling kayak on the roof of your car there's trailering and uh or not <laughs> uh, so i have uh successfully been reimbursed for trailering by hauling it on the roof of my car uh, okay. and you know, I think that uh, I think our I think what we should be doing is, you know, seeing if we can can submit it that way successfully, if that's consistent with the understanding at the district level. Uh, and if not, there may be, need to be some some national review. Uh, but I think uh, I think the precedent we may be able to look at is the fact that radios are able to be hauled in private vehicles. And so if the TCOs are getting reimbursed for that, that may be the precedent. But like you said, it may be a national discussion. Yeah. I mean, some of this is, you know, I think as much as possible, we try to follow along the boat program, what what they've done. But then you get into things like this where the, you know, trailering looks like, like it's different, where maybe the intent isn't, you know, maybe intent is uh, to help you pay for the transport of your kayak. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know that we've got a national resolution to that yet, but I think in general, I think we want to be, we want to be taking these issues to our, our diaroxes and, you know, in terms of the, the Oxpad national team, we support, you know, Get, having the PPE paid for and having reimbursement for our travel and and all of that and if you know if there's something that we need to do to try to help make that happen we're we're willing to uh, do what we can. Well, uh, th th those are some good questions. I think uh, we'll follow up with uh, a PFD document uh, incorporate uh, what Todd is uh, sharing. Uh, if you'll send that to me, Todd. Uh, yep. And we'll we'll post this deck with links in it. I think there are there are some really good uh, links in there, and uh, be happy to uh, you know answer any questions that people might have down the road on this. It's it's a process. I think you know a lot of times uh, uh, my experience has been with OpFax. It's the kind of thing that we don't do very often. Vessel examiners don't do them very often, and so uh, because they're not done very often, sometimes mistakes are made and things don't get happening right away but i i can uh, i can help with some of that too if people have questions about uh, getting their individual effects uh, through the process uh, roland uh, donna donna had a question i wanted to ask about uh, yeah. radio coverage yeah um do you set up a 
PCO at your station or do you do that mobile? How do you communicate when you're out on the water? So we are fortunate that we've got a, uh, a boat station with a big tower and we're on fairly open water and we have uh, repeater towers. So mm -hmm. I, I can I can communicate with our station every half hour, pretty much anywhere in our AOR. Uh, okay. I, you know, I think Robin has uh, addressed this in the Oxpad handbook that, you know, that there's other, uh, there may be situations where it's not going to work and you may have to have uh, set up something. I think, I think Scott is, is or not Scott, but uh, Todd has been doing something with the park service having, right. uh, having somebody, uh, you know, manage the comms and then relay that back to the station. So I think so there's, the, there's a lot of ways to do it. Yeah, Todd. So the the way that it it works for us is the fact since we're operating on a river in South Central Missouri, where comms are sketchy at best, um, cell phone towers are are few and far between and, and whatnot. Um, we have a National Park Service ranger who's also an an MS or an ME with uh, boat forces St. Louis. And uh, he is uh, going to be our radio guard. We have a flotilla down in uh, Northwest Arkansas that uses the local sheriff's department as their radio guard. And they relay uh, comms to the command center, which used to be in Memphis. It's now in St. Louis, sector upper and sector lower Mississippi River now have a combined command center. So uh, they're relaying those messages. And that's uh, what we're looking at just because of our operating area and the, the challenge of comms. Park Service has a pretty good uh, system, which they call area Arrowhead, which uh, operates their emergency system and, and deploys their rangers and water emergencies. So we're going to be working with them quite a bit. They're strong supporters of the, the mission in general anyway. So, Todd, do you use, do you use OxNet 7 or what um, frequency are you on? Uh, that's a good question. We have not officially done it yet because we haven't done our first mission. <laughs> okay. So okay. that's actually part of our, our growing pain. So our first mission is scheduled for about two weeks out on Memorial Day weekend. Okay. Um, so you know but, those Oxnet radios need to be programmed. And once they're programmed, they can't be um, reversed. Correct. We're looking at that too. I, you know, I'm uh, just trying to get something underway and talking to people to try to figure out you know, what we can do to maintain communication. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Park Service because we've got that available also. And um, I'd like to give that some thought. So thanks very much for that suggestion. Yeah, can't can't stress that enough. If, if you're working with a partner like that, a partner agency, yeah. M MPS yeah. has been really fantastic. They love the program. I mean, we're, we're a force multiplier for them, like we are the Coast Guard in the fact that we're able to do these water patrols and get... Uh -huh. You know, people down the river, when they don't have the rangers, they don't have the budget, you know, we can actually go out and do that. And so we're, I mean, one of the potentials we have, and the handbook allows for this, of course, is a partnership for with MPS rangers at some point. So yeah. it, it's been a, been a great boon for us. All right. Well, I'm in the mangroves in the Everglades, and um, a lot of our communication is even blocked by the trees. We, we've got a member that goes down and floats down there in the winter time. So uh, he's been working in, in, with MPS. He was a former ranger and, and now is an ox. So he'll he'll like to hear that. <laughs> All right, Don. Uh, thank you for mentioning Donna. She actually sent me some questions, and uh, there were some good ones here. One was uh, for orders: Does everybody submit their own? or one person and include all the operators uh, and qualifiers. Uh, I have I have kind of moved towards just putting in one order, one request. And basically, again, the way the system is set up, you can you can run this like a, like a boat mission where where there's like one lead person and everybody else is non-lead. Uh, and that that saves a lot of paperwork. And I think it's probably to me, it makes more sense all around. It's just less less work for us and less work for uh, for the station. You know, there's just less less paper to push. So uh, on that same on that same note, Roland. So when you submit uh, requests for orders, you don't have to indicate then all of the names of the 
individuals who are going to be um, accessory, just just the, the main person, right? That's right. Although I do in the notes section, I do, I right. do have a pretty good idea of, you know, who be there and how many people and okay. and that. Uh, but uh, and then you want to make sure that when you do go there to add the people in, that they're mm -hmm. they're in the system. Right. Um, and that would mean that they're, you know, that they've met their qualifications and that they're in the right sector and all those sorts of things. Um, Let's see if there's something else here. Uh, uh, she raised a question about travel time. Uh, oh. The uh, travel time counts 50% towards our mission time. So, you know, if you're planning to spend six hours on the mission and then you spend two hours travel, well, you've, you've just lost an hour off from your mission because that, you know, they're basically concerned about fatigue. And so we need to uh, to be thinking about that. Hmm. Um, she asked about, uh, do we have PPE issued and who's inspecting it every 30 days? So the 30 day inspections are basically individuals doing it. Uh, we don't uh, we don't and we don't have anybody special that's doing Oxpad PPE. It's just the same. Uh, you know, it's just our operations or our, or our materials officer that's responsible for that. And that's whatever they do. Uh, I think it's supposed to be every six months. I think ours is doing it once a year. Um, uh, we do check our PLBs every 30 days and, uh, you know, our, our, our lights. And uh, she asked about the lanyards. Uh, we, we, I, I use lanyards, and I, I hopefully everybody else is to attach the gear to our to our life jackets. But we're not. It is different. You know, we're not using a uh, uh, a vest to go over our life jackets like we do with boat crew. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, it's. I like to try to keep lanyards are relatively short, so we're not going to have an entanglement hazard. Uh, with things dangling from the life jacket. Um, and finally, she asked about uh, kind of the officer issue. We don't have uh, FSOs or uh, district staff officers for OxPad, and we are working on that. We think that's a big issue, uh, both for just giving visibility to the program and for communication so that uh, people know who to go to to get answers uh, for their district. Uh, we do have paddle craft coordinators, but that's sort of a semi-informal staff position. Uh, and we're, we're hoping to have uh, district staff officers before too long. Okay, well, um, thank you for, uh, giving us part of your evening and uh we'll we'll be getting this posted in the next few days and uh you know i'll be uh posting the the deck with the links in it as well so uh thanks for your time thank you thank you roland all right have a good evening let's see here